Today we have a formidable adversary in the shape of this logarithmic integral, and we're going to evaluate it the Feynman way. So for reference purposes, we're going to call the integral we have i. Now how exactly should we define the integral function i of the parameter, let's call it a? Well, a nice way to define it would be as the integral from 0 to infinity of log a x squared plus 1 divided by x to the fourth power plus 1 dx. Now, why exactly is this a nice way to define the, the integral function? Well, if we plug in a equal to 0, then we see that we have the integral from 0 to infinity of log 1 divided by x to the fourth power plus 1 dx. And log 1 is 0, so the entire structure collapses to a big fat 0, which implies that i of 0 is 0, which is a pretty convenient piece of information to have later on. Also note that the structure for i of a is convergent because you have this logarithmic function being divided by a quartic polynomial in x. And you can verify the convergence of the integral also by looking at a graph of the integrand in Desmos where you'll see that the area under the curve is indeed bounded. So there are no problems regarding boundedness or convergence of the integral function. So now that we have a suitable structure for the integral function, we can differentiate it with respect to the parameter a. And because there are no problems regarding convergence or boundedness, we can switch up the order of the integration and the summation operators. And this implies that the derivative of i with respect to a equals the integral from zero to infinity of the partial derivative with respect to a because of the Leibniz rule of log a x squared plus 1 divided by x to the fourth power plus 1 dx. And because you're differentiating partially with respect to a, that means all the functions of purely x are just constants in the a realm anyway. So you have the reciprocal of x to the fourth power plus 1 times the derivative with respect to a of the logarithmic function, which we know sorts out to the reciprocal of a x squared plus 1. And because of the chain rule, you have the derivative of the argument, which is x squared. Okay, cool. So this implies that the derivative of i with respect to a equals the integral from 0 to infinity of x squared divided by a x squared plus 1 div uh, times x to the fourth power plus 1 dx. We now need a partial fraction decomposition. And the good news is that all the terms are either x squared terms or the square of x squared terms. So for the partial fraction decomposition, just replace x squared by another variable, call it u. So you have u divided by au plus 1 uh, times u squared plus 1. And this can be expanded as a divided by au plus 1 plus bu plus c divided by this quadratic term in u, u squared plus 1. Okay, cool. And this implies that u equals a times u squared plus 1 plus bu plus c times au plus 1. So first up, if we let au plus 1 equal to 0, which implies that u equals negative 1 by a, this implies that negative 1 by a equals a times 1 plus 1 by a squared plus a 0. So this implies that a equals a squared divided by 1 plus a squared times negative 1 by a. So you have some cancellations here. And this implies that a equals negative a divided by 1 plus a squared. And for the values of b and c, all we have to do is compare the coefficients of the u squared terms on both sides of the equation. Yeah, the u squared terms will give you the value of b. For example, you have a times u squared, so a is one coefficient of u squared, and you have bu times au, so that is an a times b, and this should be equal to, on the left-hand side, the coefficient of u squared is zero, so this implies that b equals negative one by a times a, which implies that b equals one by one by a squared, and for the c term, again, we can compare coefficients. So I think uh, a times 1 is just a, and c times 1 is just c, and we have a plus c also being equal to 0. So this implies that c equals negative a, which implies that c equals a divided by 1 plus a squared. Okay, cool. So we have all the coefficients required for our partial fraction decomposition. 
That means I should just copy this down here. Okay, cool. Nice, so I have everything now written out in front of me. Uh, almost, anyway, let me just move this up. Much better. So finally, we can con we can conclude that u divided by au plus 1 times u squared plus 1 equals the value of a here is negative a by 1 plus a squared times 1 by 1 plus au plus the value of b is, okay, cool, 1 by 1 plus a squared. So let me just factor all that out. So you have u plus a divided by u squared plus 1. Back to the integration problem, and I'm terribly sorry I forgot something. I actually forgot something related to this term here. If I just scroll upwards, we have a negative sign attached here, and that means we have negative a divided by 1 plus a squared. So this implies that the derivative of i with respect to a equals negative a divided by 1 plus a squared times the integral from 0 to infinity of dx divided by, now we have to replace all the u's by x squared terms again. So we have 1 plus ax squared in the denominator. And this is a pretty simple integral to evaluate using the antiderivative. So this should evaluate out to 1 by root a times inverse tangent x times root a with the limits being 0 and infinity. And in the limit as x goes to infinity, the inverse tangent function goes to pi by 2. And in the limit as x approaches 0, you just get a 0. So yeah, all of this is just pi by 2 times uh, the reciprocal of root a. So that's what I'm going to write here. I have 1 by root a times pi by 2. And some simplification is in order here for the a terms. That means you have negative root a divided by 1 plus a squared times pi by 2. And we still have a couple more integrals to evaluate. One of them is 1 by 1 plus a squared times the integral from 0 to infinity x squared dx divided by 1 plus x to the fourth power plus the integral from 0 to infinity a times the integral that is of dx divided by 1 plus x to the fourth power. And both these integrals evaluate to exactly the same value. I made a video on that a really long time ago, link in the description below. And you can also evaluate both of them using contour integration, which is, again, pretty simple for these cases anyway. So they both evaluate out to pi divided by 2 times root 2. So this implies that the derivative of i with respect to a equals negative root a divided by 1 plus a squared times pi by 2 plus pi divided by 2 times root 2 times... 1 by 1 plus a squared plus a divided by 1 plus a squared. We now have the integral function, the derivative of the integral function that is completely in terms of the parameter a. So that is cool. That means we're finally at that stage where we can recover back the integral function. And for that, we have to integrate with respect to the parameter a. So... I'm going to use the definite integral over here. So I have to integrate from somewhere to somewhere else the derivative of i with respect to a. Okay, so what exactly should be my limits of integration? Well, let's recall the structure of the integral function in the first place. We defined it as the integral from 0 to infinity of log ax squared plus 1 divided by x to the fourth power plus 1 dx. And we saw that i of 0 is 0. And our target case is i of 1. That's the integral from 0 to infinity of log x squared plus 1 divided by x to the fourth power plus 1, which is just our target integral i. OK, cool. So that's what I'm going to use for my limits of integration. I'm going to integrate from 0 to 1 everything. So that means i have pi by 2 times the integral from 0 to 1. Uh, negative pi by 2, that is time this integral of root a divided by 1 plus a squared dA plus, let me just give myself some writing space. So all of that should go down. And I messed up the plus sign as well as an equal to sign, I guess. Nah, it's, it's cool. It's cool. So I have plus pi divided by 2 times root 2 times the integral from 0 to 1 of dA divided by 1 plus a squared 
pretty simple to evaluate, as well as the integral from zero to one of a divided by one plus a squared dA. Again, pretty simple to evaluate. So these two, as I said, are pretty easy to evaluate, but this one here requires a bit more work. So I'm gonna call this one here I sub one, and I'm gonna call this one here I sub two, and this one gets the name I sub three. To begin with I sub one, let's make a substitution. So let square root A be equal to U, and this implies that A equals U squared, so this further implies that DA equals two U DU. So this implies that I sub one equals two times the integral from zero to one of U, times u, which is u squared, du, divided by one plus u to the fourth power. Now, it was a lot easier back when the limits were zero and infinity, but here the limits are zero and one, so I'm gonna take help from the antiderivative of u squared divided by one plus u to the fourth power, which I derived in an Instagram post, link in the description below. And as per my Instagram post, this equals twice well, that is some antiderivative. One by two times root two times the inverse tangent of u squared minus one divided by u times root two plus one by four times root two times log u squared minus u root two plus one divided by u squared plus u times root two plus one. The limits are zero and one. Now for a careful evaluation of the limits of integration factor of two outside. So as u approaches one, we see that we have the inverse tangent of zero, which is a big fat zero, just ignore it. And as u approaches one here, we have one by four root two times the logarithm of one plus one, that's a two minus square root two divided by two plus square root two. Okay, cool. Now as x approaches, as u approaches zero, this argument of the inverse tangent function approaches negative infinity. So that means the inverse tangent function approaches negative pi by two, and you're supposed to subtract the values obtained from the upper and lower limits. So two negatives make a positive, and you're left with one by two root two times pi by two. Okay, cool. And as u approaches zero for the logarithm term, we see that its argument approaches one and log one is just zero. So again, that is pretty convenient. So that's what you get for the integral i sub one. And some simplification over here will yield me one by two times root two log. Let's expand this argument by using the conjugate of the denominator. So I have two minus root two whole squared divided by four minus root two squared is just two, right? So I have plus uh, the twos cancel out over there. So I have pi divided by two times root two now. Okay, cool. So this thing here in the numerator of the argument of the logarithm function will sort out to four plus two, that's a six minus four times root two divided by two. And using the properties of the logarithm, of course, you can write this as the difference of two logarithms. And let me just factor out this term of one by two times root two, make it much easier to write. Well, it is still, it was still easier to write, but it just looks nicer when you factor something out, right? Oh, okay, so that's I sub one done and dusted. Now, what about I sub two? Let's recall the definitions of I sub two and I sub three over here. Again, they're pretty easy integrals to evaluate. We said that this integral will be an inverse tangent structure. So I have inverse tangent one minus inverse tangent zero, which is just a pi by four term. And this here will be a logarithm term. So let me just write that out a bit. So I have I sub three being the integral from zero to one of A divided by one plus A squared dA. That's the logarithm or wait a second, one half the logarithm of one plus A squared with the limits being zero and one. So as A approaches one, you have one half of log two. And as A approaches zero, you have one half of log one, which is again 
zero. Okay, I have everything written out in front of me and now it's just time to piece everything together. So on the left hand side, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, I have i of 1 minus i of 0, i of 0 is 0, and i of 1 is just our target integral i. And on the right hand side, I have negative pi by 2 times i sub 1, which evaluates to this. And I can factor something out here from the right hand side, judging by the constant terms here. I've got lots of pi's and 2 root 2's. So yeah, let's factor out pi divided by 4 times root 2. That should work. That should work out nicely. And I have a negative sign, so that means a negative log 6 minus 4 times root 2, uh, minus pi plus log 2. And from this i sub 2 integral, I factored out pi by 4 times root 2, and I have this outside. So yeah, all that's left here is a positive pi by 2. Yeah, that, that's, that's correct, that's correct. And from the i sub 3 integral, which is 1 half log 2, uh, the 1 by 2 goes there. Yeah, all that's left is log 2. Cool. So it looks like the solution is cleaning itself up pretty nicely. So I have pi divided by 4 times root 2. Log 2 plus log 2 makes 2 times log 2, which is log 2 squared, which is log 4. Alrighty then. Then I have log 4 minus another of logarithm terms. So again, using the properties of the logarithm, I can just combine them. 4 divided by 6 minus 4 times root 2. Negative pi plus pi by 2, that's negative pi by 2. And again, I'm going to simplify this argument using the conjugate. So I have pi divided by 4 times root 2 times log 4 times 6 plus 4 times root 2 uh, all divided by 36 minus 16 times 2 is 32 which is 4 and you have some wonderful cancellation happening here and that means we have a pretty cool looking solution for our monster integral i. We have pi divided by 4 times root 2 times log 6 plus 4 times root 2 minus pi by 2, which is a pretty cool solution development. And I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.